So to get started, school absences are not good. Um, they're linked to lower achievement, reduced psychological, socio-emotional, non-cognitive, whatever word you like, development, increased problem behaviors, increased chances of dropping out of school, greater chances of using drugs, and you have lower employment prospects later on after school. So there's not a good thing one in any of that list. And this problem actually exists in early education also. So I know that when we think about truancy, we often think about 16-year-olds ditching school, right? That seems to be a much more dramatic thing to think about what they're doing behind the bleachers if they're not in class. But in fact, research shows that there's also problems with early absenteeism in the elementary grades. And of course, it's not drug use, or I mean, we hope our five-year-olds aren't using drugs, or I guess we hope no one's using drugs, but I guess especially our five-year-olds. But it's linked to lower achievement. It's linked to higher problem behaviors. It's linked to higher instances of social isolation. It's not just linked to lower achievement this year, but it's also linked to lower achievement in future years. And it's linked to grade retention. So these are issues that are popping up when we think about kindergartners and first graders. The research links truancy in those years to issues in those years and also in future years. So again, small tax. I'll try to go through it. So the stats are that 5 to 7.5 million kids are missing at least one month of school per year. That translates to 150 to 225 million school days that are lost aggregately over an entire school year. And the Attorney General cites in one of her reports that this costs California. So when kids are truant in California, this costs us $1 billion per year. No, so the first two are national numbers, and the third bullet is particular to California. And like I said, the problem starts early. So people are concerned about truancy and absenteeism early. So 10% of kindergartners in the US are missing 10% of the school year, which would classify them as chronically absent. And then 14% more are missing one to six days below the cutoff for chronic absenteeism. So in sum, about 25% of all kindergartners in the US would be considered chronically absent or just shy of that. So a quarter of all kindergartners in the US. And the risks are exacerbated, probably unsurprisingly, for children living in poverty. So kids in poverty are four to five times more likely to be chronically absent than their more advantaged counterparts. And we can see these patterns in California. So in California, using Southern California, where it's sunny right now, as an example, LAUSD has a truancy rate of about 44%. So that's obviously a center city type of district. Valencia, which is a neighboring suburb, the truancy rate is 5%. Arcadia, which is another neighboring suburb, the truancy rate is only 10%. So it's really hitting kids that are in our urban districts. So there's been a policy response to all of this, and it's been fairly large. I'm not going to go through these, but these are examples of it's showing up. It's showing up in the news. It's showing up in state agencies. It's showing up in nonprofits. And importantly, and recently, there's been a big federal response to this. There's the new program called Every Student, Every Day. And it is a national initiative to try to reduce chronic absenteeism. And why I think it's so unique is that it represents a partnership of multiple stakeholders. So this isn't just a Department of Ed initiative. It represents Department of Ed, of course, but also Health and Human Services, um, Urban Department, and the Department of Justice. So this really is a multifaceted, multi-stakeholder approach to trying to reduce chronic absenteeism. And what it includes is evidence-based resources, as they call them. So that includes toolkits and data sources to try to address chronic absenteeism from within the community. So addressing things that the stakeholders would all be interested in, like schools and families, but also social services and the legal system, which wouldn't necessarily be something that would just be a Department of Ed type of thing to address. Increased data collection and resources on chronic absenteeism and a much greater public awareness of this issue. Because many people don't know that 25% of our nation's kindergartners are in fact chronically absent or almost. Within California itself, a large response has actually come from the Attorney General's office. And within that, this is a multi-year initiative to try to combat truancy before it turns into other issues. So Attorney General Harris's 
point of view is that if you don't stop it early, it's just a symptom of something later on, right? And that something later on is not necessarily related to something educational, but is related to stuff that will end have kids end up into the legal system. So she's trying to stop chronic absenteeism before it gets to that point. And it includes data collection again. So you can see that both at the federal level and at the state level, there's a big push for more data collection and dissemination. And the interest that she has and the interest that I have is how do we prevent this, but also how do we intervene? And how do we do this early? Oh, there's another one. And then, so there's the federal response, there was the state response, and then there's the research response, of course. So the research response is trying to figure out what are these factors? What do we know about what's causing chronic absenteeism? And how can we prevent that? And so what we see so far in the research are as a focus on individual factors, so disengagement, alienation, um, health is a big one, family and household factors, so what family and household factors are affecting truancy, and that includes family structure, so if you have two parents at home, is that easier to get the kids to school versus having one parent who has to get to work very quickly. Parental involvement, so how involved are kids in the parents' schooling, how much do the parents know what's going on. SES, like I said, so high poverty families happen to be absent a lot more, so what's going on, what are the resources that are missing. And neighborhood quality. So if I see that a lot of kids are truant around me, am I more likely to be truant? If I see that the neighborhood has a lot of people who are unemployed, do I start questioning the value of going to school altogether? And there's been some work in school processes. So if my friends are absent more, am I more likely to be absent? And what's my relationship with teachers, with school personnel, and how important are school nurses? So these are all the factors that have been studied in the research side of it. But there's actually a big piece missing. And the big piece that's missing is actually how the research is so far disjointed from the policy. We don't actually have a lot on what to do and how to intervene. If you, if you look back at the types of factors, they're, they're factors, right? They're very much contextual factors. And it's hard to know what points we should intervene at any of these. So if we find that alienation or educational disengagement is important, it doesn't really tell us how we should enter into trying to reduce disengagement. Same for parental involvement. If we see that highly involved parents have kids with fewer truancy rates, how do we prevent that? How do we get parents more involved? So that's where I came in with Attorney General Harris to think about two issues. One. How bad are absences? What do we not know about the effect of absences? So there's still a lot that we don't know on the detrimental effect of absences. So that was the first piece that we're working on, is how bad are these absences? And the second point is, how do we identify any points of intervention? How can we intervene, in particular to a policy entity like the Gender General's Office, how do we do it in a scalable and replicable way? So understanding this, of course, gives us a more robust understanding of not only how bad are these absences, but where can we start entering to try to reduce these absences. So the approach that we've been taking over the past year with the funding from Stewart has been two-pronged. The first was a qualitative approach. So we went into three districts, one in Central California, one in Southern California, one in Northern California, and asked, asked district officials, what do you know about truancy? How bad do you think it is? What things seem to be working? What factors are important? Any specific issues that are particular to your district? Or do you think those things are more widespread to all districts in California? And using that data, we went to the quantitative analyses. And we tried to find, yes? So the question was framed in terms of truancy, not chronic absenteeism, but the two are not equivalent. Correct. Um, we, we looked at both. So truancy is more of a disengagement truancy issue. Is a narrow of within That's correct. That's correct. The policy entities, and also, I am also I'm concerned about chronic absenteeism as well as truancy. So chronic absenteeism, this is a good point, is excused or unexcused absences because we believe that if you're missing school for anything, you're missing school. Within that, truancy is a subsection where you're missing school for, for lack of a better word, delinquent reasons. So we're curious about both. Why are students missing school at all? And why are students missing school for delinquent reasons? So both are important. So asking the district officials that, 
led to the quantitative analyses. So could we identify any patterns in these interviews that actually might help us try to find some sort of causality or some sort of trends or patterns as ways to then jump off next year into actually trying to intervene and try a few of these things out. So, so far there are three studies. And what I'm presenting to you today is actually a synthesis of these three studies. We think there are lots more, but this is a snapshot. Think of this as a balance sheet. This is where we are right now, but this is certainly not the end. This is three of X number of studies that we plan to do. So one study, we looked at the effects of absenteeism. So again, that was the first question we had is what's the effects of absenteeism on kid outcomes? And actually little was known about timing that we could find in the research. There's a big assumption like I'll talk about that September absences matter the most. And so we were curious, do they matter the most? And so we looked at that. And then the second way of the project was to look at how to intervene. And we looked at how can we help parents. And we use national data to do that because national data is very rich in context and process variables, whereas district data doesn't have survey responses, let's say. So it's much more difficult to do the second types of questions with district data. So I'm going to show you the three studies. And again, if you have questions during the three studies, definitely raise them because we're going to move on. They're not necessarily all linked together. But the first is the role of timing with one of my students, Jacob Kirksey. And like I said, one of the concerns is that kids are not engaged. And the assumption is that they're not engaged early. There is the assumption that September is the month we need to worry about. And so there's something called Attendance Awareness Month. And that happens in September. And if any of you follow anyone who studies absenteeism on Twitter, in September your Twitter is blown up about awareness matters in September. And then October happens, and you don't hear about attendance anymore. <laughs> so the question was, does that matter? Does September matter? National Awareness Month. OK, so we actually know very little. Does the fall matter? So the assumption that the fall might matter, of course, is that it's the scaffolding period, right? It's the period of imprinting. So if we can get kids into school early on, they'll build good relationships with their teachers. They'll build good relationships with their peers. And this develops academic scaffolding for the rest of the time. So if they learn 1 plus 1 in September, it's a lot easier to learn 4 minus 1 in March. And if they're missing that groundwork, it's going to be pretty hard to get them to understand the much harder stuff later on. But the other side is that spring matters. So college students often go to the review session because that's where they get all of the information for the final exam. So if we're thinking about exams, Maybe all that matters is the period leading up to the exam, because that's the point where you can get all of the information for the semester. So for those who believe that the spring matters, teachers review content for that entire year. I give my nerdy example. I'm an economist, so I like nerdy examples from math. On the AP exam for calculus, there's going to be more questions about derivatives, which you learn in March, April, May, than there are about limits, which you'll learn in August and September. So if you're there for the more complex stuff and you had that quick review session, maybe the spring is all that matters. And so missing this complex material is going to be more detrimental than missing the easier stuff. It's easier to catch up on the easier stuff. These are the two sides of the debate. So, yes? But they're, they're somewhat different arguments, right? The, the, the one has to do more, it sounds like, yep, yep. more to do with sort of acclimation to school. Mm -hmm. That's right. Where the second has to do with the mastery of academic content. That's right. Those That's are right. Very different arguments. Right, right. So I would yeah. So I would agree that there are potentially two different mechanisms going on here. Yeah. And I would just say, I mean, I'm curious the extent of the analyses of fall matters yeah. associated with analyses suggesting that chronic absenteeism in the fall predicts sustained chronic absenteeism. Yes. Or persistent That's right. Chronic That's right. That's right. That's right. And so for, I should have said, does fall matter for test scores? Mm -hmm. To use some sort of metric. But that's right. That's right. It could be predictive of other items as well. Yes. And actually, selected September 1 to coming back and establish a school climate. Uh -huh. Two is the chronic absenteeism is ongoing. And so the idea of constant monitoring, which wasn't being done mm -hmm. for absenteeism and pinpointing within not just the overall school, the district data, but I. 
identifying individual districts, schools were shocked to discover that 40% of those students on an individual basis were chronically absent. Mm -hmm. And when you have 95% attendance in a school, mm -hmm. at 95% there's still schools uh, heady chang with attendance worse not in Oakland. Yep. You know, they researched substantial levels of chronic absenteeism they were completely unaware of. Absolutely. So the point in September was to establish the absolute importance of a monitoring system. Yep. And, and that's really uh, when you get to the end of the year and then you discover, oh my, kids haven't been here, which was what was happening. Yep. Uh, we've got a, a huge problem that not only is our pattern is great, but academic loss and is disruption of everyone. So that's yep. really the focus early uh, was, you know, it, it's not just where students are most harmed, but for education as a system to mm -hmm. wake up. And, you know, Hetty led that. Yep, yep. Uh, That's right. That's right. That's right. And you make a good point that that ninety five percent attendance rate does mask particular issues. Even with that, it can be excellent mm -hmm. overall, or not bad, but also there can be severe problems within disaggregated data where you look at ninety five percent, especially when you break it down by race or ethnic group, male versus female, ages. We were the old point is to discover. At the beginning of the you know, be awareness throughout the year, are there patterns systemically that are allowing absence to continue? Right. That's right. That's right. So in the confines of, of this study, we looked at achievement. But yes, I agree that there are different potential objectives to look at. That's right. So within, within the confines of looking at achievement, um, we asked two questions. The first was, does the timing of absences matter, and for whom? Um, so the data set we used are Southern California School District data set for this particular project. And I'll explain why in a, in a second. But we had about 4,000 kids. They are grades 3 through 5, 67% Hispanic, uh, about half are ELLs, and 63% received some sort of meal assistance. And the outcome was test. So we looked at tests. And I'm presenting just the, the math today. But the patterns are the same. But for simplicity, I'm just showing you the math patterns. But the English patterns were the same. But this is the CST. So we're looking at standardized tests. So the reason why we use this particular district is they gave us incredible data on when every kid was absent. So not just fall versus spring, but exactly the date of the absence, which we found really rare. I've used East Coast District data before, and we're not, we were not given that. We're given total absences, total excused, total unexcused. So the unique thing in this data set was that we actually knew exactly when that kid was absent in the year. So we're really excited about that. And we started by looking at fall versus spring. So how many absences did the kid have, did the student have in August to December versus January and May? We included excused and unexcused for this run. And then we broke it down. So the question was, does the timing matter? So we wanted to look in more detail. And we looked at bins. So how many days? There were 30 days before the test. How many absences did you have in those 30 days? Then it's the 30 to 60 day before the test. Then it's 60 to 90 before the test, and so on and so on. So we looked at these bins to see how many absences you had leading up to the test. And then we looked at the absence for the exam. And part of the reason we did that was if we found that an absence was mattering for the exam after the exam was taken, then that would give me a sign that something else was going on altogether, right? So how can it, an absence in June affect my exam score from March? So we needed to make sure that nothing happening after the exam could be influencing an exam score that was taken in the past. And then we included fairly common characteristics of the students in classrooms. Like I said, when you have district data, you don't get a ton of richness in terms of teachers and classrooms and attitudes. But, for, but you do get a ton of richness in absences. So it's a trade-off. So for a project looking at the effects of absences on achievement, our biggest factor was the absences, so we went with the district data. Again, I'm going to nerd out very quickly. I'm going to do this for each of the studies. Um, so our outcome was the math score. We looked at the number of spring absences, the number of fall absences, and again, remember, we break that out into the bins. The kid characteristics, 
the student characteristics and the, the yeah, the student characteristics and the classroom characteristics. We clustered our error at the classroom, meaning we think the kids in the same rooms might be experiencing similar things even though I can't see that. And so I'm just gonna control for that in my model. One more slide of nerdiness. I also control for the fact that schools are probably really similar and other schools are similar but different from the school I'm in. So I control for that, that's using school fixed effects. And then I control for the fact that classrooms are really similar. So I have three kindergarten classrooms. I'm assuming this one's similar, this one's similar, and this one's similar in some way that I can't see, right? Something's going on in these rooms, and they're each unique, right? They have different teachers. So they're each unique, so I'm gonna control for that. And I'm gonna look at absences and how they vary within a single classroom, and I'll make a comparison of that. So that's what's going on with these fixed effects. I'm fixing what's going on in the classroom, and then I'm gonna look at the variation in the kids. And what do we see? So these are spring absences on math test scores. We had fall and we had spring, and we had all of those other variables, the gender, the ELL, the race, et cetera. And we find that spring absences were significant predictors of test scores. So if you missed a day of school, your test, your math scores will go down. But there was no influence of fall on the spring test score. So again, remember, this is a spring test score. Yeah? Spring absences before the test. Exactly. These are spring absences before the test. So then we broke it out even more. So remember, we were interested in these bins. And the only thing that was significant was the absences that were 30 days or less before the test. This is 30 to 60, not significant. 60 to 90 before, not significant. These are the days after the test. Remember, that was a good test to make sure that absences weren't actually representing something else. Not significant. So the only thing that mattered here were the number of absences that were one to 30 days before I took that test. And then we looked by characteristics. We found that girls, the absences that they had, hurt the tests more. We found that high achieving students who were absent, those hurt their tests more. We found that non-SPED students who were absent, that hurt their tests more. And we found that non-ELL students who were absent hurt their tests more. That means that the test point decrease was larger for each day for girls over boys, for high achieving versus low achieving, for non-SPED versus SPED, and for ELL versus non-ELL. Yeah? Is that because there was less, less, uh, less of a new parent and girl with lower achieving? That's what we, that's exactly right. That was one of my like, points that I was gonna show. You're like reading my mind. That's exactly, well that, that's what we're hypothesizing. We actually don't know, but we think that there's a bigger opportunity cost right. for the high achieving students if they miss a day of school. Whereas exactly, the lower achieving, it's sort of, they're sort of tailing off anyway. So I was going to ask that when you said you looked at or the reasons you looked at the two different time periods. Yeah. Of whether or not you would really be focusing on two different types of students. Who are absent in the beginning versus yeah. those at the end. That's a good point. That, they might, that there might be a certain subset of students who are absent only in fall. And those who are, is that what you mean? And those who, and there's a different group that steps in in the spring. Right, and the ones that, that had the biggest difference mm -hmm. in the spring, they're, they're doing a whole lot better than the ones. Mm. And I mean, I care about them. Yeah. But they're not necessarily the group that I have to, right. to advocate. Right, like the ones in the fall who are missing, they've already so far declined exactly. that they don't, that's, that could potentially be happening. Okay. Yeah. Mm. You know, just sort of thinking about this in the abstract, you know, that, that kids who are, are the girls, first of all, mm -hmm. um, you know, kids who are doing relatively well in school, uh, kids who are not special education, these are the yeah. kids who have sort of the best chances of being successful. Right, right. So, so what, what you're seeing, in fact, is in, in some sense a confirmation of that, mm. that, that they're the least likely to be chronically absent when they are the consequences that are the most damaging for them. Right, right. That's a good question. That's a good point. 
And I could, I, it would be interesting to see how the patterns differ yeah, I, I before mean, even, yeah, exactly. I probably have that somewhere. I just, question, yeah. Sort of what the conditions are probably doing. Right, right, absolutely. That makes perfect sense, but, yeah. But your measure is a spring test. Right. So what you're also experiencing uh, is teaching to the test and test anxiety. Mm -hmm. Because the anxiety factor with high achieving students uh, is related to absenteeism. Mm -hmm. When the teacher in the fall, they're not teaching to the test and focusing on preparation for the test, right. which happens, and I don't know which districts mm -hmm. you're talking about, but very explicitly in some schools and districts. So clearly you would expect absenteeism mm -hmm. during the period where the test is the focus mm -hmm. to have a greater impact on the test right. than performance, than absenteeism on the content early mm -hmm. and also you know, setting the climate of the school. Right, and right. I think in some ways you could set the data with girls, high achieving students who would want to investigate that relationship uh, impacting your measure. Yes. Yes. So speaking to so one of my, it's like you're both predicting my next slide. So one thing I want to say is that it's sort of a glib answer that spring absences matter for spring tests, right? But I must have this somewhere. There's always an exam of some sort. That's sort of one conclusion you could think of is this was just measuring the effects of absences on a March test, but there are always points of assessing kids. So one answer is yes, spring absences matter for the spring test, but in a way, all absences kind of matter, right? Depending on when the exam is. So one thing to be concerned about, of course, is this teaching to the test. Are we gonna start having kids attending to the test, right? So if the only test that matters is a CST in March, how do we make sure this information doesn't come off as the only absences that a teacher needs to worry about are the ones from March to April, right? So the point is that there always are some, there's always some sort of educational achievement exam or signature something that matters for kids. And so the, really the point is that the pieces up to those points are the ones that matter, but those points happen in October and there might be something in September. The points happen in November and there's something leading up to November. So right, so if, if we're thinking about just the spring exam, the attendance closest to that matters, but we need to think about how a whole year looks and we need to think more about how these differences exist and why they exist. So why is there this difference in gender? The high achieving students, perhaps they have higher opportunity costs as I mentioned, and then how do we think about non -sped, our SPEDs and ELLs? And that was study one. Yeah. I was just gonna ask, even in your study one data, how did you take into account the fact that you know, you're using CST for uh -huh. tests, but common vulnerability studies can be used in other ways, possibly the CST is not allowed to be used after the test is completed? Um, CST is an absence. Right? Yes, we did not take that into account. <coughs> the data were from, I'll have to think about that more. Yeah. Was it I don't remember the date. It was 2000, I don't remember the date. I think it was 2011 to 2014, something like that. Okay, I'll so have to look. The yeah, that. exactly, exactly. I'll have to ask my PhD student. Okay. These are things beyond my. So that was, that was our first study looking at the effects of achievement, or effect of, at, of attendance on achievement. But what the interview data really gave us was information on context. And that type of stuff we can't get from a, a district data set, like I said. So the next study we did was looking at self-control, school attitudes, and chronic absenteeism. And again, this is where the interviews really came into play. So here are three examples of some of the data we got from our interviews. Counselors and social workers are really helpful. When teachers feel they can't manage, they make a referral out. So we've had a great collaboration with counselors. Last year we added money to add school counselors. They would ask for more funding if there were. It's a high priority. We have a lot of school climate strategies that address positive attendance, blah, 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 blah. We're making a big investment in socio-emotional climate. So these things kept popping up when we were talking to district leaders. So the idea of school counselors can really help with chronic absenteeism and can build a better schooling climate. 
So for this, we were interested in school counselors. And not necessarily what are the effects of school counselors. It seems to be positive. We were more interested in what do you tell school counselors to do for chronic absenteeism. And the Attorney General's office on their side wasn't so interested in the effect of school counselors because school counselors are expensive. And remember that one of their entry points is scalable and replicable. And so putting out a policy recommendation that every school should have a school counselor is a big strain on districts' budgets. So what we were interested in is how can we develop kids? What are the entry points for developing kids socio-emotionally? What could we tell the infrastructure that's already in place in our districts? So we we're interested in the why, in what mechanisms might underlie school counselors. Why are districts saying there's a positive effect of school counselors? And I guess it's a longer term question. If we do think that districts should have more school counselors or schools should have more school counselors, what would, what would we tell them? What, what's the effect? So for this study, we started with kindergarten. And part of the reason for that was the fact that a quarter of our kindergartners are almost are or almost considered chronically absent. So we thought this was a good population to start with. It's also a population that's starting, right? They're starting school. And kindergarten is filled to the brim with transitions. It is a very potentially stressful time in a kid's life. So thing requires new adaptations, and that could be really stressful. And that stress leads to negative school attitudes. And negative school attitudes leads to increased absenteeism. But what research has shown in the developmental psych literature is this bottom bullet. More self-control might actually be linked to school attitudes, and so maybe more self-control can also be linked to reducing absenteeism, where self-control was defined as the ability to manage emotions, behavior, and attention. But there's actually no evidence linking these things together, linking self-control, school attitudes, and absenteeism. You see different pieces of it, but there hasn't been one study that's examined all of these things at once. So we were interested, are these things aligned? Can self-control link to school attitudes? Can self-control link to absenteeism? Perhaps self-control, teaching kids self-control, is an entry point for counselors. And is it important in kindergarten, in this particularly stressful year when self-control could actually be really important for kids? And so not having this information, like I've been saying, makes it really difficult on what to advise schools and districts and counselors if we don't know all of these links. So what I've been describing is our speculation. So we think that higher self-control leads to less frustration at school. They're more interested in the academic content. They're more interested in socializing. There's less conflict. So they become more eager to go to school. And this eases the transition. So in a way, self-control makes school a more positive place. And they're less likely to adapt what's known as school refusal attitudes, right? So I don't want to go to school. So if I have more self-control, school becomes a happier place. I'm less likely to say, I don't want to go to school. And as a result, potentially absences decline. So this was our, our model that we looked at to how does self-control get us to chronic absenteeism. So we asked, does self-control link to school attitudes? And does self-control link to absenteeism? And do the school attitudes link to absenteeism? So for this study, we used what's known as the ECLSK. It's the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study. These kids were in kindergarten in 2010, 2011. It's a National um, Department of Education data set. These, they keep following these kids. So these kids are obviously older now. So the data keep continuing, but we're interested again in the kindergarten. And it was a survey of parents, of teachers, of school administrators, and it was um, consisted of direct assessments of the kids. So in this survey in kindergarten, parents were asked, how often does your kid complain about school? How often does your kid feel upset about going to school? How often does your kid fake sick to stay home? And the answers were more than one time a week, one time a week, or fewer than that. For the next question, we were interested in absenteeism. And so they asked the teacher to report on the kid's number of absences. And like I mentioned, when using the district data, the district data was much more rich when it came to absences. The ECLSK isn't as rich 
So we had to use 11 or more days as I am chronically absent. So that's, the, again, the trade-off in these data is this one is exceptionally rich in what we know about the parents and the families and the kids. But we know less about absenteeism. The other one, we know a lot about absenteeism, but we know almost nothing about the families. We need to find some sort of happy medium, but that takes a lot of more money. So, so self-control was our key measure. It was developed by psychologists. It was given as a survey item to the parents about their kids. It was a bunch of questions. One is four, how often does your kid do blah? And a scale was created from that. Four is the most self-control, one is the least amount of self-control. And on average, the kids were 2.89. So all the kids in the data had some self-control, but it's still under three, right? So there's still a little bit of lack of self-control among these kids. And I'm not gonna go through these, but like I said, there's so much more data. So I included all of this in addition to the self-control. So we have behavioral characteristics. What else do we know about these kids? Social interaction, how often do they feel sad and lonely? How are they eager to learn? Do they report liking their teacher? Standard student characteristics, so this is what we would get from a district data set, potentially. Lots of stuff on the household. So number of siblings, number of books at home, how often picture books are read to these kindergartners. Socioeconomic stuff, maternal education, maternal employment. We know a lot about the classroom, the size, the percent of other peers in the room, teacher characteristics like age, degree, experience, and also stuff about what happened before kindergarten. So did the kids go to pre-K? Did the kids um, stay home? Did they go to Head Start? So there's a lot of detail that I can include that I can control for when trying to isolate the effect of self-control. Again, a model. So why was one of my school attitudes? So remember, question one is, does self-control link to school attitudes? Why is school attitudes? P is the parent-rated self-control. B, S, H, and C are all of those other variables you just saw. So I included all of this in one regression. And again, I do that clustering by the classroom. So because kids share things that I can't see, I know they share things. So they're not just random atoms floating around. They actually are sort of clustered by being in the same room. So I control for that. The second study is almost the same format. Those outcomes from the study one are now in the set of independent variables. And the key outcome was chronic absenteeism. So the first one is, does self-control predict school attitudes? And we're going to move school attitudes over with self-control. And does all of that predict chronic absenteeism? So these are effect sizes of the effect of self-control on those school attitudes. And what we see is, and you could interpret this either way, higher levels of self-control led to lower levels of these items, or the way that it's put here, lower levels of self-control meant that the kid was more likely to complain about school, more likely to be upset about school, more likely to fake sick. So this is what theory would have predicted. So the psych literature finds less self-control, more school refusal attitude. So this was good for us, that we found the same thing that the previous literature had found. And we also found the largest effect for being upset to go to school. I'm not sure why that is. I mean, they're all sort of similar, but we see the largest effect for complain and I guess upset. I guess maybe kids who are five years old haven't really mastered the deceiving their parents to fake sick yet. Yeah. Uh huh. Cultural mastery of speech and uh -huh. is a huge match. Yep. Uh, in especially in kindergarten, we see a big difference. Mm -hmm. in, uh, those aren't self control, <clears throat> but they do impact uh, being upset about being going to school and, and going to school. But it's not so much of the, also the age of the student in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Mentally, yep. there's a tremendous developmental variation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, among kindergartners, uh, it's one of the greatest ranges to over puberty. Uh -huh. and it spreads again. Yep, yep. As a side plug, I have a paper coming out on cultural match between kindergartners. And I find that um, when there is a cultural match, there are lower 
socio, no, lower negative socio-emotional ratings. So that's, a, in other words, the cultural match is a good thing. As a totally different paper. It's coming out in, um, the AERA has a journal and they're having a 100 year epi ep episode issue. <laughs> it's not TV. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. But yes, so they don't, so the, the problem with, I guess isn't a problem, but you can't survey kids, right? They're, or at five year olds, they're too young. So all of this information is surveyed by the parents about their kids. And so it's hard to get at something like bullying because they don't ask the kid, how do you feel about your classmates? The perception would need to come to, from the teacher or from the parent. So, but, so they don't have that measure, but it is an important measure to think about. And maybe some of the other, I'm not gonna, actually it's too far back, so maybe the, some of the other measures that I have in there on how do I feel anxious, do I feel impulsive, might capture some of that, but yes, there is no direct measure of bullying yet. They are following these kids until fifth grade, so they might throw that question once the kids can answer their own, I think they can answer their own questions in third or fifth grade, but they're too young now. Okay, so this was study one, the effect of self-control on these school-going attitudes. But the real question is, how do all of these things play out on chronic absenteeism? So we ran the model. So it includes all of those boxes of variables. It now includes complain, upset, and feel sick. And these are, what's the odds of me being chronically absent? So an odd greater than one means that I have a greater chance of being chronically absent. So that's bad in this case. An odd lower than one when it meant that I had a less chance of being chronically absent. When I complain more, I'm more likely to be absent. When I'm upset more, I'm more likely to be absent. When I fake sick, I'm more likely to be absent. And we see the same pattern here, but what we didn't find was any link of self-control. So self-control might be an entry point for school attitudes, but self-control itself doesn't link to chronic absenteeism. It wasn't statistically significant in any model that we ran, but the school-going attitudes were linked. So it's kind of an interesting conclusion so far, right? So when it comes to self-control and school attitudes, there's a positive, or there's a link, right? So more self-control, fewer worse attitudes, right? More self-control, I'm more likely to have better attitudes. So targeting self-control by counselors in the school might help with school attitudes. And school attitudes and absenteeism, there was a link, right? So better school attitudes meant I was less likely to be absent. So targeting school attitudes might help with chronic absenteeism. But there was no link between self-control and absenteeism. And so self-control might be something to target, but not as a way to directly reduce chronic absenteeism. So self-control might matter for school attitudes, and school attitudes might matter for chronic absenteeism. But if we go into the school counselors and think that self-control itself is linked to chronic absenteeism, that's not the right way to intervene. Yeah? Now, I always wonder if that is for a particular young student to take it. Yeah. However, if you are trying to do the PCLS uh -huh. and look at other reasons why kids might not be safe in front of you, for example, since kindergarten is not mandatory, mm -hmm. it's not appropriate, mm -hmm. is it one of the reasons why parents don't take it seriously and then say, oh, today I'm not going to drop ah. it? They aren't explored in the data set. That is my third study tries to get at the parent issue. So how do we get parents involved? But yes, they don't ask the parents, how do you feel about school? Is school important? So no data set is perfect. But I mean, so I guess you could do this as a smaller scale study with one school if you can get access and survey parents and kids. They don't know a lot. We don't know, but they don't ask, do you accomplish? So we have to use proxies. So for example, if both parents work, they may be less likely to be able to accommodate a kid being absent. So we try to get that into the model, but there aren't any direct measures of, I feel this way about my kid's school. They, a they ask items like, are you involved in the PTA? Do you go to parent-teacher conferences? It's the same panel, but particularly with kindergarteners, because yeah. kindergarten is mandatory. Though. Right, right, no, they don't ask. Well, it, it is a six year goal. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The student becomes six, 
than it is mm -hmm. that students are sometimes not enrolled, or the behavioral pattern <laughs> is developed. Which yeah. That's why the emphasis on September. Right, right. Okay, so that was study two. So study one, what's the effect of absenteeism? Study two is trying to get out how can we intervene in kid behavior? Study three is sort of how do we intervene in parent behavior? Yeah. Before you go on to that. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. So there isn't any data on, on the counselors themselves. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the third study is called linking getting to school with going to school. And again, we focus on kindergarten. But before getting there, here are three quotes from some of the southern CA district officials. So often truancy isn't the student's fault, right? So remember, these are young kids because they are unable to get to campus. Like maybe the route this, this, to school goes through an area of the neighborhood the parent isn't comfortable with the kid going through by themselves. Anecdotally, we had a family living out of a small RV. They would find places to park and had difficulty getting the kids to school. One example is when these students' parents were unable to get them to school because they lived across town and the car broke down. We heard a lot of getting to school. So in the first, the second study, we heard a lot about counselors being helpful and trying to get kids' attitudes to change. We also heard a lot about getting kids to school from district officials. So we wanted to focus on that. So it seemed like coordination and logistics for young kids, you know, for young kids with parents with young kids, are important to getting kids to school. But what do we tell parents? Get your kids to school. We see that here that the RV broke down. So then what? What tools or practices might help? In other words, what can we capitalize on that already exists in the district? And how exactly how important are these coordination and logistical factors? So we must understand the how. How important are these logistical factors before we go out and try to fix the logistics? So again, where to start with starting school. So again, kindergarten is super important. It's a huge transition period for the kids which was study two. In study three, it's a huge transition period for the family. So there are direct and indirect issues. So the direct issue is that kids now need to get to school on a daily basis, especially if they haven't gone to pre-kindergarten. And parents are potentially uncertain of how to do that. It's a big shock to the, to the family system, right? All of a sudden, the kid has to go from being at home to having to be somewhere every day. So the newness itself in trying to get these routines down might make kids miss school. The RV breaks down, parents don't have time for it, you have to pack lunch, you have to do a million different things that you didn't have to do before the kids went to school. So that's a direct issue. New logistics are thrown into place, families have to adapt, absenteeism might increase. But there are indirect issues also, and these veer into the socio-emotional world. So this uncertainty of how to do all of this is stressful it's stressful for parents. And if it's stressful for parents, that stress often is stressful for the kids. And so the child level anxiety increases. So mom and dad are stressed. I'm now stressed. I don't want to go to school. So you can see the school refusal behaviors from study two could potentially come into play here with all of these logistical changes happening at the start of kindergarten. But there's actually very little evidence on any programs or practices that could help. So my proposition is that the school bus is actually really helpful. And I know that seems really basic. But I'll show you on the next slide. But, it, but, but there, are two, there are two issues again, right? So how do you solve the direct issues? The school bus is a schedule. And so if parents are new at this or uncertain, here is something that shows up at your door every day at 7 o'clock. Or here is something that shows up on the corner at a group meet at 7.30. Same place, same time, every day. So it instills this regularity that parents aren't really sure about in kindergarten in this transitory year. And this indirect issue is that this establishment of the routines eases family transition. I'm not so stressed anymore being a parent 
because one thing has been taken out of my hands. I don't have to get the kids to school. The bus is here. Kids are out. I go to work. So with this reduction of my stress, my kids are less stressed. Anxiety is lowered of the kids. School refusal latitude decline. So like I said, it seems sort of silly to be talking about school buses, but most dialogue about school buses actually talks about safety and standards. I went to the American School Bus Council website, and they have five issues in their theory of action, and only one of them pertains to kids going to school. And within that, it talks about truancy buried deep within that theory of action once I clicked on that prong. So the other four talk about safety and standards and putting the community to work, which are all important things, but buses are also at their very core physically taking kids to and from school. So in a way, we're faced with a void. On the one hand, we think school buses matter, and the school bus council thinks school buses matter, but no one's made that intersection for how they matter for education. So is the school bus an effective strategy to get kids to school? We sort of don't know. There's lots of anecdotal evidence, and buried in the fifth prong, the school bus council would say yes, but we actually have no idea. So that was the purpose of study three. <laughs> Does taking the school bus actually reduce absences based on the theory of, yeah? So there was no data then uh, after this uh, surprising test? Mm. What, about whether or not absences were Not that I could find. Mm, yeah, so but that would be an interesting right. experiment to complement this, is not what's the effect of buses, what's the effect of pulling those yeah. buses away? Right. Yeah. And without absence, the kids can't afford those classes, then right. could we have invested on the public system or would not go? Right. And on top of that, the public system isn't as reliable, for lack of a better word. The yellow school bus comes to your front door or whatever the meet point is, whereas the other bus, the parent needs to walk the kid to a bus stop, and the bus may or may not be coming every 17 minutes or not. So it, it adds back in the logistical stress. So it's not simply when you take the buses away that it's the buses are gone and now there's more logistics to deal with. It's the stress is back. So it's both. It's the direct and the indirect. So we looked at what's the effect of, or I looked at, what's the effect of buses? And again, are there any differences between key child and family characteristics? So who are the buses helping the most? And again, the best source of data for this were the ECLSK, so again, this big study, Kids were in kindergarten in 2010, 2011. There were about 14,000 kids. I didn't mention that before, but there's a lot of kids. The absences, again, were the teacher measures of absences, right? So sacrifice of using this big data is that we don't have direct information about the kids' absences every day. But again, we get lots of information about this other stuff. So I looked at the number of absences that the teacher reported, and then this chronic absence cutoff. So was I chronic absent? Was I not? And then the key measure was, how do I get to school? They asked the parents, how does your kid get to school every day? Of that, a quarter took the bus. So 25% were bus takers, school bus takers. These weren't public bus takers, school bus takers. And all, the rest didn't take the bus. And of that group that didn't take the bus, 70% were driven by their parents. And 86%, so a bigger portion, was driven by someone in the car. So 86% were driven by someone in the car. Of that, most were driven by a parent. So really, this study is a comparison between did I take the bus or did someone drive me? So we're really trying to get at this logistical issue, right? That someone has to drive me. That takes a lot of logistics and coordination. Or am I taking the bus? And then again, lots and lots and lots of data could be included, right? So we have demographics. I wanted to know about the kindergarten and pre-kindergarten experiences. So if the kid, if the child was in pre-K, they've kind of already had this extra year of practice at going to school. And in fact, the study I wrote before partnering up looked at the effects of pre-K on K chronic absenteeism. And I do find that when you go to pre-K, you're less likely to be absent in kindergarten. And the theory I use is this trans transitional language type of theory that pre-K is like boot camp, not just for the kid, but for the parents. 
So I wanted to include those types of experiences in my model so I could control for that and look at a more pure effect of bus taking. For this study, I wanted to look at other factors at kindergarten entry, including academic and socio-emotional factors, and then lots and lots of household characteristics, the same types of stuff as before. So education, uh, income, employment, number of books at home, parent structure, yeah. Did you talk about distance from school? Yes, distance to school is in here. Or it'll be in one of the slides. Yes, distance, is it in there? Distance to school and average minutes from school. Because distance from school can be really long but really quick. Or you can live two miles from school in LA and it could take an hour. <laughs> so again, the model is absence outcome, right? So was I chronically absent or in a different model, the number of absences? SB, did I take the school bus? X were everything else that I just showed on the previous slide. And then I like to nerd out as an economist, so I tried two different model specifications. So one problem is that some counties might have better bus options. And those same counties might be making other kinds of investments in making sure kids get to school or are at school. But I can't see that in the data set. So what I do is I look within a single county. And I look at who takes the bus, who doesn't take the bus in a single county, controlling for the rest of that county. And that's known as county fixed effects models. The other problem, which might be a bigger problem, is self-selection. Right? So parents are choosing to put their kid on a bus. By doing that choice, that's a big issue in terms of trying to estimate. Right? Because if the parents are involved enough to make sure their kids are on the bus, the parents might be involved in other ways that would reduce absences. And so the effect of bus taking really be the effect of bus taking or be the effect of all of this other parent stuff that I can't see. So what I tried to do was match kids. So kids who took the bus, I try to find a kid who looked like they would have taken the bus, except they didn't. So I try to find pairs. You can think about it like that. Like, or, yes? So some parents might want to have the choice. Right. The bus. That would be a more ideal scenario in the, for, for the purposes of modeling. Yes, yes. But if the parent does have the choice, then why are they choosing? And I can't, no one could see that from any sort of data set. But yes, if I could sort of randomly give this family a bus and this family not a bus and see what happens, that would be the ideal. And that's sort of what's going on with this propensity score matching, is I'm going to find two families that look the same in the data set. Only one of them took the bus, but they look exactly the same on everything else. Yeah. And are they families that were in the same school? Um, we look at that, and it's a, I, I, this is an I study, not with the students. Yes, I look at that, and it, didn't, it doesn't make a difference in that. Yeah. Um, are you throwing together kids who are in districts that do have school busing, that do not have school buses, mm. do not rely on each other? Mm -hmm. and they're yeah, so that's, yep. So they're on that's being accounted for. No, and then it, it is being, yep. Is so I do both. I look at everyone all at once, and then we try to separate out by these okay. other. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. So. I don't know why the titles are at the top. I tried to fix that, but I gave up. But yeah, these are those three kinds of models. So nothing but all of the variables. Then I'm going to just look at the county separate and see what happens. And then I'm going to try to find pairs. But in any case, this is the number of days absent. And this is, am I a chronic absentee? And these are effect sizes. No matter what the story is, if I take the bus, I have fewer absences, and I'm less likely to be a chronic absentee. And of course, when you do the matching, which I think is the best experiment, although it's not a real experiment, but the closest, you actually see that the effect is the largest. So bus taking reduces the chances that I'm chronically absent, even more so than just being absent. It's actually not pushing me over the edge to be chronically absent. And then who does the bus taking Help or hurt? So help, I looked at healthy versus unhealthy children, because unhealthy children are often absent. Remember, not just truant, but could also be absent. So what we see is that healthy children actually benefit from the bus more than unhealthy children did. But again, this could be because unhealthy children are staying home by choice, right? So if you have health issues, the bus might not be the most important thing that you're thinking about as a parent. 
you might be thinking about the health issues of, the, of your child. So for the group of, unhealthy, of healthy children, they were helped more. Did I attend pre-K or not? So what I found, which is interesting, and corresponds to the other study I was telling you about, those who didn't go to pre-K actually benefited more from the bus. And my thinking is exactly what I was saying before, that pre-K had the boot camp. But the families without the pre-K, the bus is essentially serving as their boot camp. Poverty versus non-poverty, so the number of absences, non-poverty families were helped more by the bus, but there was no difference in chronic absences. So this really isn't so much a poverty, non-poverty issue in terms of the bus itself. Mm. And what we found a lot of times, that's exactly the opposite, that where they say limited English speaking, English as a second language families are not going to care. And what we found is when you talk to the communities and your parents, mm -hmm. there's an extreme motivation that my kid will have these advantages. Mm -hmm. But there is a bias among those who don't look in expectation will be lower. Yes. So it's actually not surprising that non-poverty, the bus has a, a higher yeah. Uh, Helping for that Helping for that group, yeah. Against what people would have thought. Wisdom. Yes, yes. So I think so. The next one, the mom employed versus not employed, I think goes along with this pre-K. So actually, the children with non-working moms were helped the most by the bus, and that goes back to the idea of the structure. So if the mom, if mom is at home, kid might have a more accommodation to stay at home, right? The mom's like, well, I'm going to be home anyway. You can stay home. And so the bus helps with that because the bus is there at 7 a.m. every morning. Whereas the parents who are employed have to leave the house also. And so the idea of logistics isn't such a big, ideal, a big idea for parents who are already working because there already is a schedule in place. But in families where the schedule is a little bit more flexible, like mom is at home not working, the bus actually serves for logistical purposes. No difference in distance. So distance to school, everyone was helped the same amount didn't make a difference. Although with the minutes to school, the children with the longer commute were helped more by the bus, which again to me speaks to logistics. So if it's a long commute to school time-wise, parents may give up right in the beginning. This is all about transitions for parents. And if it's an hour to get to school, the parent might say, I don't, I don't feel like driving an hour today. It's OK, why don't you stay home? You'll go tomorrow. Not if the bus shows up. So again, small font. I thought this would be an IMAX screen. So a big void in the role of bus taking, but it does seem like bus taking is helping, especially so for reducing chronic absenteeism. So how can we rely more on school buses is the first question. But a second order question is, how do we induce a school bus effect when there are no buses in the district? And that's a key question. So these are questions for the policy folks to think about. Can we have? community people getting together and with escorts or big brother, whatever it might be. So these are the questions is how do we induce some sort of regularity and logistics in the absence of funding to have school buses? And then the differences matter, right? So we saw that not going to pre-K actually, those kids were helped the most, non-working moms minutes to school. So these are important families to think about when we're thinking about logistics. This is shining through as a logistical issue with families. So in sum, this is the three studies that we've done so far. There are lots more to come, hopefully. So we saw that timing matters. Not all absences were created equal. If we're thinking about just an exam itself, the absences closest to the exam mattered. So on the one hand, does an overemphasis on the fall create an imbalance if we're thinking about spring exams as our objective? But on the other hand, as I said, there's always an exam. right? There's always something at school. So the point is that if you're missing any sort of period before you're being assessed, then you're missing that period in September, in March, whenever it might be. Attitudes matter. So school attitudes matter. School going attitudes matter. But it was important to, under, to try to disaggregate this more than what's been done before. So self-control mattered for school going attitudes. School attitudes mattered for absenteeism. But that third link didn't exist. So this helps us start to think about how can counselors best help with chronic absenteeism. And logistics mattered. So kids on the bus were more likely to attend school. This is true even in kindergarten. So how do we use our infrastructure that already exists 
to help kids get to school? And what do we do when the infrastructure lacks? How do we still get kids to school? How do we help families with logistics? And now I can clip that. Okay, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we're going to have to convert all of our chronic bike students into attenders? Or mm. is it 10% of them? Or is it 1% of them? That is a good question. I wish I didn't make this so small again. But the effect sizes were, were fairly, so they were fairly large. They'd be considered medium to medium large for sizes of, of these, this type of work. So it's not experimental work, so it's not the same type of, but yeah, the effects is, are fairly large, but I, I wouldn't, I'd have to look in more detail at your question, but that's a, an interesting point is how many people or how many kids could we actually convert to non, yeah. Well, as an economist, yes. the framing of the question would come down to dollars. Right. What I, what I mm. ask is, is when a student is thought to be truant, yeah. do you send a car to get the student? Mm -hmm. And they say, we can't afford to send a car. And I say, well, if you send it this time, students aren't out alone, how many days of attendance mm -hmm. would you increase by showing that level of commitment to knocking on the door in the wonder that you might show up? Mm -hmm. And then you extend that over the course of a student's career. Mm -hmm. And if it's 15 days, which is fairly reasonable, and maybe much more, that's worth close to $1,000 in apportionment. Mm -hmm. Does it cost $1,000 to send a car or driver to get this kid. Right. If not, you're losing money by not doing it. So I think in the way a lot of schools think about apportioning resources, linking this to payment for average daily attendance would be a really interesting study because, you know, again, the cost benefit, and we can't, in this instance, it's very short-sighted. Mm -hmm. right. you know, we've had real success in some areas of getting greater follow-up on students by showing an economic analysis. So that might be a helpful way for you to frame yes. the attendance costs. Yes, that's right. This, the the yeah, stat I showed in the beginning us. was Kamal Harris says that it costs us a billion dollars a year in absenteeism. What happens if it costs us $2 billion to implement school busing? And then learning, I, I think learning matters. But Somebody else? Yes. The return of impact to school attitude. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of got two things going on there. You know, sending some, having, caring enough mm -hmm. to send someone to get the student to get the student to school impacts the attitude towards school, and so you really right. Need to that. That's a great point. Exactly. It's also if you think of, I mean, how many things can we bundle into one, right? So if the school bus takes care of parental anxiety and getting the kids to school, then you've reduced child anxiety and you've reduced exactly. absenteeism, right? So a good, a good strategy is how many strategies can we, can we realistically put in? I think that makes a lot of sense. I've already had my turn, but I want to No, ask, please. I want to ask a completely unrelated Oh, question. okay. Was not related to the research at all. Yeah. A lot, for both the state and the core school districts are talking about, and the core school districts are actually doing it, mm -hmm. uh, using chronic absenteeism as an indicator of accountability. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a good idea or not? And as you've looked at these data, as you've thought about this, does it stand for other things that you think are important? And should it, should schools be held accountable for it? It's, that's an interesting question, right? So, I mean, yes, I guess you asked it, so it absolutely is. Um, it's, it's interesting because the, the, actually it does link to these, these studies. The, pa the second two studies, and especially the third one, would say that absenteeism isn't about the school. Right, that it's a parental logistical issue. So we're, we're potentially holding schools accountable for something that actually starts with the parents. More so than, to me, a more linear thing to be held accountable for, I mean, could be test scores, right? I mean, people think, have different views on that, but let's say. We'll do that too. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's say that we hold schools accountable for test scores. We assume that teachers are the ones, or the curriculum is the one that's linking kid to test score performance. Whereas I'm not sure that it's school itself that's linking kid to showing up, right? So it's a, it's a challenging question because now we're asking parent or asking schools to make sure kids are there on time when it actually might not be at the school. The school might not be the policy lever. 
So that I'm not saying yes or no, as an academic would. It's a yes and no. But it's a good question. It's because like other things, although there are also, but socio-emotional development is another one that schools are being held accountable for or will be. And that's another one that's, sure, there is a teacher effect and the school effect, but then there's also the parental effect. So it's not as, it's not as neat, I feel, as, as an academic outcome. Okay, so let's uh, thank Michael. For thank you.